There's no animal products in it. It's simply herbs. And uh, once we get going, we will, uh, if, we, you know, if the business gets uh, beyond the capacity of the people that we have in South India to manufacture the medicine, uh, or anyway, at any rate, we will ship it in uh, bulk form. Uh, so it won't, it won't be packaged for sale. So we won't have to pay import duties or we won't have, it won't be recognized as medicine. It'll simply be herbal products or plant products. Uh, in that way, we don't have to get into the whole uh, issue, the regulatory issue of uh, importing medicine, see, uh, which is a very thorny issue. We want to avoid that completely by, we're not importing medicine, we're importing simply herbs, plant materials. And then it's packaged in, in the U.S. or in Canada or wherever it's going to be sold. Uh, so we already figured out, you know, how, how to avoid the problem. And the other thing is, um, longer term, the problem is that the multinational pharmaceutical corporations are patenting and copywriting natural herbal remedies and then making them proprietary. So what we're going to do, part of our whole program is to publish the information about these traditional herbal cures very widely on the internet. And uh, in that way, we, uh, there will always be prior art to prevent any move to patent or uh, privatize these uh, herbal remedies. We want to keep them in the public domain. And so one of the, the interesting things about our source uh, the guy that we're working with there, is that he is open to this process of uh, disclosing the actual formulas of the medicine. You see, this is a very, very important aspect, and we won't do it unless uh, this uh, program is in place. We're not going to do the deal, we're not going to do the business unless the uh, uh, formula of the medicine is public knowledge, you see. That prevents us from getting in the bind of being uh, uh, viewed as a competitor by the drug corporations. Because we're not a competitor, this, no this knowledge is public. See, we're not it's not a secret thing, it's not a proprietary thing, it's not a private thing. Um, so we're, we're going to make, just like our, all of our other material, we're going to make the uh, information about how to make these medicines public knowledge, open source. The rest said, wow, that's brilliant. Well, we don't want these rascals to do what they've done already with, they tried to copyright, um, what was it? <laughs> not, not Hing, no. They tried to copyright Neem. Can you imagine this? Copyright name. How are you going to copyright a tree? Go to every tree and stop their name. On it's it. nonsense. It's just total nonsense. But no, the use of, of the name, whatever the, the active ingredient is in the name, as a medicine. Some rascal corporation has, and they destroyed, oh, Kapila Day was telling me they destroyed the, the, the um, um, indigenous medicine business in Peru. The, the, by Peru, they got uh, they got Peru to to sign this treaty. The the rascal drug companies, huh? and of course, you know, U.S. and E.U. are behind this big time. They signed some treaty that they would only basically only distribute copyrighted medicines, and so they actually made it illegal to sell native medicines. I mean, this is, this is going on over the world, and it's a very dangerous thing. This new H.R. 875 bill before Congress now is very, very dangerous. because It's the so-called food safety bill. And basically what it means is that any food which is not grown according to commercial industrial standards is deemed unsafe. Uh, if, it doesn't, if it's not full of 
of genetically modified organisms and uh, herbicides and pesticides and all this crap. Um, they're basically going to outlaw organic gardening is what they're going to do. So uh, it's a very, very dangerous law. And uh, if you live in the U.S., write your congressman, stop it. Uh, there's big, big agribusiness and uh, uh, these p same people who are doing the genetic modification of orga different organisms are sponsoring this bill. The husband of the congresswoman who introduced the bill works for Monsanto. Okay, does that tell you something? So these rascals, they're trying, they're, they're willing to destroy the world for their own profit. Uh, so we want to counteract that. We want to uh, create a space uh, where, where people with ethics, people with honesty can thrive. Uh, we want to create a community for honest people. So we want to do that in somewhere, somewhere where we're out of reach of these rascals. Uh, I mean, they're introducing the... Chile is pretty smart. They, they, they were against this uh, treaty. They didn't sign it. Peru and some other South American countries signed it. Chile didn't sign it. They wouldn't ratify it. So, uh, you know, Chile is holding out, but, you know, who knows how long they're going to be able to hold out. Um, yeah, I'll give it another couple of years. We want to get out of here. <laughs> we want to go someplace that's wild enough and that's viewed as uh, unimportant enough that nobody's going to try to regulate it. Huh? And just stay like under the radar. But of course, we still need to have our connection to the internet. So interestingly enough, South India, uh, they have this. They have good wireless internet, y WiMAX. They're developing or implementing WiMAX, which is the same system as they're going to put in here. And also the, the land is very cheap, it's fertile, and there's a very strong ancient tradition of uh, organic agriculture there that we can just plug right into. And also the, the majority of the people there are Vaishnavas. Uh, we can be, we could buy a piece of land in a village where everybody is worshiping Lord Vishnu, or even Lord Nishingadev, Hari Bo. <laughs> huh? So uh, that would be so much fun, wouldn't it? I hope I'm in South India and Andhra Pradesh. Don't mumble. I was just saying that uh, in Ahovalam, uh, in Andhra Pradesh, also in South India, they have like, I think, eight Nishingadev temples all in like the same area. So there's definitely a big cult of Nishingadev uh, yeah. in South India. Yeah, yeah. But um, we like, we like uh, to worship Lord Nishinga in his happy mood. Uh, they, you know, some devotees, they worship Ugra Nishinga when he's angry. Yeah, ripping and tearing. Mm. And uh, this is a little bit dangerous. When the, the ISKCON devotees, you know, they wanted to make, uh, they wanted to worship this deity of Ugra Nishinga. And they had, they had this guy in South India carve him, you know. And even before the deity was finished, he almost, his shop almost burnt down because... <laughs> <laughs> the fires were just starting like automatically and uh, <laughs> so he was saying come down here and get your Nishinga Dave before he burns down my whole house get him out of here and I was in one village we were we were traveling on Padiatra uh, from Hyderabad to the southwest and we went through this one place that looked like it had got hit by an atomic bomb. I mean, it was just devastated. Nothing would grow there. It was like pfft, finished. And uh, there was remnants of, of a, the only structure still standing was an ancient, ancient temple. You know, the black stones, the way they make, you know, it looked almost like Stonehenge, these big black stones and everything. 
was very impressive. So we camped nearby there. When we, while we were there, a caravan came through. I mean, a caravan with buffaloes and camels and horses and carrying stuff. You know, we were way out in the country. So these guys came and they were camping nearby. So we went over there, talked to him, and uh, yeah, I think we invited him for prashadam or something. And then, so we asked him, what is this place? What happened here? What's the history? They told us this whole story that the, uh, there was a king, very pious king, and he installed Nrishinghadev, Ugra Nrishinghadev. And uh, he was, you know, worshiping him very nicely, offering, you know, like 12 offerings a day and so on, worship very nicely. And then his son, when, after this king left to this world, his son, who turned out